everyone. This is Morgan from the New England Quinn QIO, and I wanted to thank you for joining us for today's HAI webinar on improving patient outcomes by reducing CAUDIs in ICU. Before we get started, I'm going to quickly review a few housekeeping items. This call will be recorded for training purposes, and I'll provide you with details on accessing the recording at the end of the webinar. The phone lines are on mute for the duration of the presentation. However, just to make sure, if you could put yourselves on mute and um, try not to put us on hold, because um, sometimes the hold music does come through, we'd really appreciate it. Um, we are going to take questions at the end, and I'll provide you with instructions on how to unmute your line at that time. But for now, I'm going to pass it over to Carol Deep to get us started. Thank you, Morgan. Good afternoon, and welcome, everyone, to the New England Quinn QIO HAI webinar, webinar, <laughs> webinar series for November. Mouthful there. Um, as Morgan mentioned, I am Carol Deep, and I am the HAI Regional Task Lead for the New England Quinn QIO, and have the privilege in, to introducing our three guest speakers for our webinar today. But before I do, I want to inform those of you on the webinar who are new to your role or possibly new to your hospital about both the New England Quinn QIO and who are the contacts for your, um, for your state related to the New England Quinn QIO. The New, um, the New England Quinn QIO, we have staff in all six states and is being led by the health-centric advisors who have partnered with, with Qualadyne to form the New England Quinn QIO. Now, you're probably saying, boy, that's a mouthful. Just want to let you know the um, Quinn QIO, those are little acronyms, and the letters Quinn, the Q-I-N, stands for Quality Innovative Network, and the QIO stands for Quality Improvement um, Organization. So basically, we are a regional quality improvement organization that's focused on innovative practices, um, innovative ideas of, to implement best practices, and it's all about patient care. That's our total focus. We are here to provide technical support to reduce HAIs for those hospitals that have agreed to work with us, as well as regional educational support for those hospitals that are engaged in implementing evidence-based best practices to reduce their HAI rates and to provide the safe, safest care possible for their patients. Thus, that's why we're having this wonderful webinar today. Our goal is to help create the healthiest region in the United States. As I mentioned, we do have staff in all six states because we know that health care is local. On this slide are the names and contact information for the HAI state task lead who would love to hear from you if you have any questions concerning the New England Quinn QIO as well as our webinar series that we are in our second year um, in providing to you. So now let's get to the business at hand. Next slide, please. Reducing catheter-associated urinary tract infections, otherwise known as CAUDIs, has been a very difficult task for so many hospitals throughout New England as well as the nation. Norwalk Hospital, an acute care hospital here in Connecticut, has been working on this project for over two years and has some amazing results which, will be, which they will be sharing with you today. As I mentioned, I have the privilege of introducing our three speakers. Our first, Joe Ritchie, is the Manager of Nursing Education, Research and Quality as well as the American Nurse Credentialing Center Pathway Program Coordinator at Norwalk Hospital. She serves as the hospital team leader of the Interprofessional Quality Prevention Workgroup. And with her clinical background in critical care, Jo has built a career focused on nursing clinical competency and the value of evidence-based practice as an impetus to quality-focused patient-centered care. Along with the Quality Prevention, Jo has lectured on the Rapid Response Team at the American Association of Critical Care Nurses National Teaching Institute and presented her work on glycemic control at the American Nurses Association National Quality Conference. As a certified clinical nurse leader, Jo has contributed to the publication of the first Clinical Nurse Leader Review Manual. Jo holds a bachelor's bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of Saskatchewan, Canada, 
and a master's degree in nursing from Fairfield University here in Connecticut. In May of 2016, she will graduate with a doctorate of nursing practice from Fairfield U. The second speaker is Erin Fitzgerald. She is currently the manager of infectious control and prevention at Norwalk, where she's been working for 33 years. That is outstanding. She serves on the interprofessional quality prevention work group and tracks and trends all the infection control data. Her background in nursing education and medical surgical nursing has paved the way to her dedication to infection prevention at the hospital. Erin has a BSN from Clemson University in South Carolina and her MBA from Sacred Heart University, also in Fairfield, Connecticut. And finally, our third speaker is Lesbia Jackson, who is the Director of Patient Safety and Regulatory Compliance at Norwalk. She serves as one of the quality improvement leaders for the Quality Prevention Work Group. Lesbia has a background in critical care and trauma and has an extensive experience in process improvement and strategic planning. She holds a bachelor's degree in nursing from Temple University in Pennsylvania and a master's degree in nursing from Fairfield U, as I mentioned, in Connecticut. Without further ado, I will turn the microphone over to the Norwalk Hospital Interprofessional Quality Leaders, Joe, Aaron, and Lesbia. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. That was a very uh, healthy introduction. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being with us for the next hour or so. We are pretty excited um, not only to share our experience in improving counties, but also to hear from you as well at the end of this program as to some of the uh, some of the things that you have tried um, in your improvement efforts, because I know this is something that everyone is working on to ensure that they, we are improving or preventing. As you can see on our first slide there, our objectives are to highlight the dynamic changes in the U.S. healthcare environment as it relates to catheter-associated urinary, urinary tract infections, you know, preventing of those infections, of course. We'll focus on the tenets of infection prevention in the intensive care unit using a collaborative interprofessional team approach. Of course, you know, we have discussed predominantly the ICU. I'm sure, like most of you, we are all moving forward to ensure that this uh, improvement is spread across all of our organizations. Um, right before I get into just telling you a little bit about our hospital, I think I wanted to um, bring us back to the background of why we are really, all of us are here to discuss um, our improvements in terms of preventing catheter-associated urinary tract infections. Um, we know that HAIs, as Carol initially mentioned, do affect both not only the quality of our patients, but the economic structure that we all work in in healthcare. And for some of us, the economics are the impetus, but for all of us, I understand that treating the patient and making sure that we have good patient outcomes is really the priority here. We know that the CDC has made this a top focus as well, and we they have informed us that one out of 25 patients have developed by HRI in the hospital. Of those, about 80% are related to UTIs, uh, related to catheter infections. So, um, as hospitals, you know, we are exposing, we're exposing patients to these uh, events, and we have to, uh, as well as look at the cost reduction or prevention um, related to cost that we may encounter. So, I say that to say that it's so important for us to know the background of any initiative that we start. Many of us, I know, are in healthcare or we're in quality groups. And when we have an initiative, we kind of go very quickly forward to make sure that we um, get the right people on board and we're telling everyone that this is important and we need to prevent it. But knowing that having the good background and doing your research is an added layer to help you develop our team. And I gave you that little bit of background because that was so important in how we started our program. So on that slide, you'll see that we are a 328-bed hospital. 
Our average daily census is about 200. We are not for profit. We are to care. We are community based. We are a teaching hospital as well. We serve about 272,000 um, customers in the Southwest Connecticut. And we're about about an uh, hour and 20 minutes outside of New York. That's another thing that we look at, not only within the hospital, but you have to look at your community and the makeup of your uh, population whenever you're looking at any process improvement. We, our ICU specifically is about 16, it is 16 beds. We are a mixed medical, surgical, and cardiac unit. Our average daily census for our IC is about 12 patients. As you can see, there are top diagnoses for sepsis, acute respiratory failure, acute myocardial infarctions, um, GI bleeds, and drug overdoses. Uh, when you look at your uh, population, <laughs> you can see, you know, sepsis being our number one. Uh, before catheter, before the focus was on catheter prevention, I'm sure most of those patients probably did have a catheter, and we could all, you know, probably remember that. So um, in nursing, in our nursing leadership team, we're, as, as we've said, we're a teaching hospital, uh, not only for residency programs, but in our nursing, uh, the makeup of our nursing, the number one drivers of many of these initiatives, we have a strong, um, strong education background with all our nurses. We have about 79% of our nurses have their BSN. We have 14% have our MSN and many certifications among the nurses in the different specialties. And um, for our nurse leaders, many of them are pursuing their doctorates in some way. And recently, specifically for the ICU, we are proud to um, just say that, that we won the Beacon Award, the Silver Level of the Beacon Award, which is given by the American Association of Critical Care uh, Nurses. And that was very, a very prestigious award for us. A little bit more in the background of uh, infection prevention, counties to be specific, we have to really look at the climate that we're trying to work in when we're tr working on initiatives to prevent HAI. Uh, back in 2000, we know that the Institute of Medicine published one of the documents, which I call it. You know, I look at it as one of the uh, health-altering uh, documents of its time because it really put the hospital part of section really made the public sit up and take become more aware uh, of what was really going on within the hospital. So the Institute of Medicine uh, to Eric Human in 2000 when they did publish that there were about 98,000 deaths in the hospital due to medical errors. And then in 2014, that number had ballooned to 400,000. So just thinking of that, we think of how many were related to infections. There was a great deal of those related to infections. And they subsequently followed up that publication with the 2001 crossing the polychasm in that one, they were more specific and more focused, telling us that there were six healthcare aims to improve safety. And one was safe uh, to improve care. One was safety, efficiency, effectiveness, equitable, and timely, and patient-centered. So given all that, we know that the healthcare, there was a growing demand to look at how we delivered care and to ensure that it was the best, of course, the best outcome. And also in that background, there's the healthcare costs that were ballooning out of control. And of course, you know, now we talk about some payments and many other uh, ideas around payment and prevention. So uh, at least we were not left out there alone. What they did was we started to stimulate more of the job market and the American Recovery Act, as everybody knows, it's important to know that because that kind of puts money into the healthcare system. 
not like they are now taking it out, really, with the budget cuts. But there was an infusion by the federal government about about $787 billion earmarked for improvement in health care. Predominantly, everybody is maybe aware of the High Tech Act, or which brought on meaningful use. Meaningful use was probably one of us, a good starting point for all of us to start to look at how we were delivering care. Um, in that one, there was more money added. There was like $30 billion, billion incentive for hospitals to really look at their care delivery and start to really push things forward to in the terms of preventative care. And But you had to prove that you were actually having good outcomes through meaningful use. And Meaningful Use has really three stages. You set a baseline to capture information. You gave uh, the patients access to their health information, which was quite interesting because during their access to that health information, this really um, gave the patients more emphasis to look at what we were documented within their medical records. And many of them really were starting to speak up about infections, and they had the Institute of Medicine um, kind of background with them, so they became uh, more savvy consumers. So right before I hand over to um, my colleague, Jeff, uh, um, Joe, I'm sorry, um, we just have to talk a little bit. I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about our goal and progress towards forming this team and really realizing our improvements. And it's an interesting story, really. Uh, we started back in 2008, and really before we came to a place where we had this robust team that really Joe led, we had, like, two false starts. And the first start was, it was just Aaron and I, infection control and quality, kind of the way we used to do things, knowing that this was something important. It was something important to our patients who wanted the best outcome, and if we could prevent um, a catheter-associated UTI that we will have better outcomes for our patients, of course. But the way we went about doing that is really without all the information, we had done some of the background that I mentioned in terms of why it was important to look at this as an initiative. But what we did is really took it to leadership, and in that dynamic change of our leadership changing, uh, we did not get the buy-in we expected. So we kind of had to go back to the drawing board. So we were like, what are we doing right? What is working? What is not working? We went back to our, our PDCA cycle and looked at that. And the second start was we had, we decided that we were going to continue to try. We had a few interns who came on board with us that were doing their masters in public health. And they were going to help us. A new Pair of eyes, we gave them all the criteria. We went through the process exactly what we needed to accomplish and wanted to accomplish. We went back to leadership and said, okay, we thought this time it was really going to happen. We're going to, we have a process. We know how to prevent. We're talking to people in the ICU. We're getting our device days. And for some reason, that didn't go anywhere either. We thought we had all the pieces in place. But what we did not have is what Joe gave us. Joe was coming off of uh, being a process, you know, a, our process improvement department had really solidified uh, a way to improve uh, this particular issue. She came on with fresh pairs of eyes. We formed a really robust interdisciplinary team, and that's really where we started. And that, you know, kind of gave traction. And initially, we did not feel it was moving as fast as we liked it because. Of course, Aaron and I had the background of, oh, we have done this before. But just slowing down a bit and really, really digging deep, having that background with why it's important. And then, in addition, now we were really encroaching on value-based and meaningful use when you really had to prove that you were actually having good outcomes. So Joe took it over from there and started the team so she could really um, – so this slide, good afternoon, everyone. This is Joe Ritchie. So this, this particular slide is actually quite appropriate in, in identifying that it is a time for change. So back in 2008, um, it was identified for us that there were eight preventable healthcare-associated um, hospital-acquired conditions or healthcare-associated conditions 
Um, and you can see that over a six-year period of time that that number has uh, has increased from 8 to 14. And, and circled there is one of them, which is catheter-associated urinary tract infection. So um, from many vantage points that Lesbia has identified, it, it is an opportunity for us to improve, and it is a time for us to change. So um, Aaron is actually uh, elsewhere on campus going through Ebola training. So I'm going to jump in right here um, in her place. And just really define for you what we mean by catheter-associated urinary tract infection. Many of you already know these definitions, but I think it's worthwhile to identify that each year, U.S. hospitals have estimated about 1.7 million healthcare-acquired infections, resulting in approximately 99,000 deaths. And these infections are dramatically increased uh, patient morbidity and mortality and uh, as you can imagine, has significant economic consequences for healthcare institutions. So UTIs are really tied with pneumonia as a second most common uh, healthcare acquired infection. Um, it's tied with pneumonia and second to surgical site infections. And UTIs account for more than 15% of, of infections reported by acute care hospitals. Uh, virtually all of our healthcare associated UTIs are caused by instrumentation. And um, when we started this process improvement, uh, it was important for our nurses who really were our um, drivers for this change, for them to understand uh, that cause of infection was due to in, uh, instrumentation. And we do know that catheter associated urinary tract infections can be prevented. Oops. So, by definition, a cauti is a urinary tract infection where an indwelling urinary catheter has been in place for more than two calendar days with a day of placement considered to be day one. And there are two specific types, um, the SUDI and the ABUDI. So the SUDI is the symptomatic urinary tract infection, and then the ABUDI is the asymptomatic bacteremic urinary tract infection. And, um, you know, as a team, I really rely on our infection prevention um, um, experts to help us with defining when we do have potential infection. So this is where Aaron and team come in. So in order for CAUTI to be identified, it needs to meet um, steps one, two, and three. You need to have an indwelling urinary catheter in place for more than two calendar days. Uh, you need at least one of the following signs and symptoms, with it being um, uh, the patient being febrile with a temperature greater than 38 degrees Celsius, uh, suprapubic, tenderness, costovertebral, ankle pain, or tenderness. The last one for meeting the criteria for a clotty is a positive urine culture with no more than two um, species of organisms. And again, this is defined by the CDC, not by the local organization, but these are um, you know, structured based on a more, uh, a, how, a higher power, if you will. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is the impact on our patients? You know, the current perspectives of hospital or healthcare associated infection prevention, we know that there's heightened awareness by our consumers on the impact of, um, of an HAI and that there are driving costs in healthcare because of these infections. Um, we know that our population has increased, those without medical insurance, and there's an increased demand for accountability by our regulatory agencies, advocacy groups, and legislative mandates. So infection prevention is really a clear mandate. We know that um, there's an increased risk for bacteria by 5% for each day of catheterization. Um, there's a risk of bacteremia by 1 to 4% of patients with a cauti. Um, when you do have a cauti, there's the possibility of an increased length of stay. There's added complication. Um, there's added cost. There's the potential for mortality. Um, and certainly, not good things are resulting um, with this hospital-acquired infection. So let me share with you some of our baseline data, again, from 2013. We, um, as Leslie had mentioned, prior to me joining the team in 2013, there were two um, unsuccessful attempts at um, attempting to reduce uh, CAUTI. 
And so what you see uh, is a bar graph dating back to the fourth calendar quarter of 2012. And um, in navy blue are our cloudy rates. Uh, the red horizontal line that you see is really the Nissan Cloudy incidence, uh, the average. And you can see that we are above the um, external benchmark. So where the star it has identified is when we started our journey. And these are our quarterly metrics, uh, taking a look at our capacitor-associated urinary tract infection. So from a quality perspective, from a PI perspective, from a nursing or clinical perspective, definitely an opportunity for change. So that's our first set of baseline data. The second set of baseline data is utilization. And to my point earlier about instrumentation, if you don't use the Indivelli urinary catheter, you won't get a cotty. But you can see based on the navy blue bars that we were at or slightly above the external benchmark, which again is the Nissan cotty incidence mean um, for utilization. The star, which is in the center of this particular graph, is where we started. So um, some variability, which again may indicate that we don't have a process uh, that's, that's uh, sustainable or structured. But again, this is our second set of baseline data. So when you are beginning your journey for process improvement, it's important to really understand where you are as a team in the midst of your organization. And um, for me, just to highlight what our mission, vision, and values are at Norwalk Hospital, I will quote that um, the mission of Norwalk Hospital is to provide uniquely excellent, innovative, and compassionate health care with exceptional outcomes. And embedded within that particular mission statement, uh, the values embrace um, being visionaries, highlighting values, including patient-centeredness, excellence, leadership, trust, fairness, education, financial uh, responsibility, charitable cause, as well as transparency. And each year at Norwalk, we, um, the senior leadership on our board of directors, meets to identify by strategic imperatives. And these are set, again, by our, our leadership team and our board. And it's really our annual affirmation of our mission, vision, and values. So in 2012 or 2013, among the five, it's actually six pillars. Clearly, I can't count. There are six bullet points there. There are six pillars um, within our strategic imperatives. And one of them was quality, safety, and patient satisfaction. With the pressure from our external um, agencies and so forth, our senior leadership team had identified cloudy prevention as something that they wanted to focus on for 2013. And so at a very high level, um, all eyes were on us. It was very important that, number one, we identified what our baseline was, develop a team, and begin the initiative to address um, cancer-associated urinary tract infection. So how did we begin? We, um, again, as I had mentioned, um, my background not only is in critical care, but a uh, more recent background in process improvement. And it was important that as we pulled our team together, that there was some belief in structure. And so what I've highlighted for you are really the five tenets that we embraced for infection prevention. And the first one was that we needed to ensure that we endorsed an interprofessional approach. The second was that we looked to the literature to um, identify what were best practices, um, implement those recommended practices, and, and with that includes taking a look at our current state and having our frontline staff be a, a large component of the drivers of change. Um, the fourth was really to monitor our trends and outcomes, and I had shared with you our baseline data, and then to engage all of our key stakeholders. So that's all the way from um, our leadership team right through to the frontline staff. So I'm going to take you through the tenets that we had um, that we had implemented here, and uh, hopefully share with you our story. So first off, here's our interprofessional team. Our team consists of um, not only um, clinicians at the front line, 
But we have a um, hospitalist who is also board certified in infectious disease. Um, my background in infection control. We have managers, staff nurses, and Carol joined us from Claudine. Mm -hmm. So uh, she was able to give us not only some guidance uh, locally, but also regionally, and, and that was instrumental in us in making that initial um, step. Mm -hmm. So as I had mentioned, we started on June 12, 2013, and um, we started off with a four-hour session of this interprofessional team, and we, we started off with education. We educated the group on what catheter-associated urinary tract infections were and why it was so important for us to be meeting on a regular basis to begin to begin this work. So we gave background information to the team, shared with them our data, identified why data was important, and then highlighted what the best practices were. Um, then uh, the work, the team went to work within the first hour. We used a plus delta table to um, identify things that were important and things that we felt were urgently needed to be uh, addressed. And so using, at first, everything fell into that top quartile. Everything was urgent and everything was important, but uh, we realized that the work was so overwhelming, um, we had to prioritize what we were going to address first, and so we had identified what our next steps would be. Um, so we turned to the literature, and these are just a few um, highlights of what we found as excellent resources. Again, the CDC, there were some profound documents that really helped to guide us. Um, and um, looking at the healthcare-associated infections, as reported by Nissen, uh, we used um, research and information from HICPAC, um, which just so everybody is aware, it's a real, it's a federal advisory committee that's assembled um, to advise and guide the CDC. And so, again, the information from HICPAC was, was profound and very in, influential for us. And as I had mentioned also, working with Carol from Qualadine was, uh, was also extremely beneficial. So what did we identify when we did look at the literature? These were some of the key elements that our team felt was important to address um, very early on. The first thought was when to insert um, the indwelling urinary catheter. Um, and we needed, we identified that the insertion was only when appropriate. We did not have bladder scans, and so I'll talk about that um, later, um, later on in my presentation. We did not have bladder scans, but knew that those were important. We knew that aseptic technique was important, but yet we were not um, fully embracing all of those steps related to aseptic technique. We were not doing a daily assessment, although we knew it was important to capture how many patients in-house had a fully catheter. Um, training our staff on insertion and maintenance. Um, just a survey of the staff, we realized that many of our staff members did not have formal training when they were hired to Norwalk Hospital. That the last time that they had received any training on a fully catheter, on insertion, was during nursing school, and, and we had a lot of tenured nurses, so it was many, many years. Hand, hand hygiene was, um, we're always looking to improve our hand hygiene. Um, closed systems and unobstructed flow. We had one particular product that, um, number one, did not fully embrace aseptic technique, and number two, um, we had different generations and, and types of products on all the different units that uh, when a patient was being admitted to the ICU, for example, from the emergency department, the first thing that our nurses would do would be to break the seal um, and change the drainage bag to an hourly urometer. So we knew right then and there that we were, you know, deviating from what best practice would be, which is to maintain a closed system. Um, early removal and having the proper clinical decision support, uh, we did not have but knew that that, that was evidence-based practice. Um, and documentation of discontinuation uh, in the nurse-driven protocol, we did not have but knew that it was important as well. So after reviewing the literature and identifying things that we wanted to work on, we um, started to implement some of our practice changes. In the next two slides, 
I'll take you through the um, the different things that we had done. And again, keep in mind that this wasn't something that we had done, you know, in the first month of our team. This is really the list that I'm providing for you is almost um, like a year and a half or almost two years, no, a year and a half worth of work. Um, but again, the dedicated team, predominantly made up of staff nurses, was was key. So let me start off with proactive rounding. Um, again, we're talking about the ICU, and what you see in quotations is Cotty Audi. You need to have a leader on your unit or in your area of care who's going to be driving the change. Um, this person for us was Audra, and Audra, um, she was our assistant patient care manager, and she really helped to develop our interdisciplinary goal sheet for the ICU. And each morning when she did her rounds, if a patient had an indwelling urinary catheter, she would ask why. And so the staff nurses had had called her Cotty Audi. Um, you know, the second she saw her, they knew they would say, the Foley's coming out, the Foley's coming out. Or, you know, the patient had a urological procedure and therefore the Foley needs to be in. So staff engagement at the very beginning was low, but as time went on, it increased. And, and it took, um, they embraced the changes and knew that it was their responsibility to um, prevent clotties. If we did get a clotty, and believe me, we did within the first year, uh, we did a root cause analysis um, for every single cotty, and we looked at, um, you know, why the Foley, why the cotty, um, what could we have done to improve, and it was not considered punitive. It was seen as more process improvement. Um, dashboards are key. You know, it was very important for us to be transparent with, with the data that we had and compare ourselves to external benchmarks. I think that's uh, historically, what we were doing, we were comparing ourselves against ourselves, and so we could see the ups and downs of the, the, the work that we were doing, but um, comparing ourselves to Nissen, for example, and setting a goal um, is absolutely key, so transparency is, is important. Um, and then the change of shift handoff, that goes really hand in hand with the interdisciplinary goal sheet, because it is not just the nurses that are handing off, but it's the physician to physician, physician to nurse, um, and again, I'm talking about the ICU. We had um, invested in um, a different brand of intervalling urinary catheters, and in that particular catheter, there was a label that we decided as a team to use as a visual cue, and this label um, has the date and time, the department where the catheter was inserted, and allows an opportunity for the staff member inserting the Foley to put their initials. So as you're walking by the room and you see the, the drainage bag and you see the orange sticker, it was a you know a visual cue to say, hey, this patient has a Foley, and then begin the, well, why the Foley? We had identified that education was an opportunity for improvement, particularly because many of our nurses did not have um, formal training uh, upon hire to our hospital. We validated, revalidated, if you will, all RNs in the entire house, all the surgical PAs. We validate, we provided education and validated their competency on insertion. Um, so, in order to facilitate that, it wasn't, you know, Aaron, myself, or Lexia. What we had done was we had identified champions on every single unit. And we had, uh, we have a clinical ladder here, and we had um, identified that as a clinical ladder, if they were part of our improvement team and they assumed the role of this nurse champion, it would give them credit towards their clinical ladder. And our clinical ladder, though, the incentive is financial, um, so at the end of each fiscal year, they get a, you know, if they meet the certain requirements, they do get a check up um, from, they get a check, period. Um, our technicians, we provided education during their annual review about maintenance, and we still at this point have struggle with this. Um, starting today, as a matter of fact, we have the new skincare products, which one of them is really focused on peri care. So, again, with that particular element of education, we continue to build. 
and provided um, education for our transport team so that they understood the bag was supposed to be below the bladder um, and also for physical therapy. So there was education provided um, for many disciplines, and perhaps one bullet point that I didn't add was our physician team. We did provide um, physician education, and it was more peer-to-peer education from our um, physician champion of our team. So here's the second slide on what practices we've implemented, and there's a dollar sign um, right behind the equipment because these are things that we actually purchased, um, and we had approval from our senior leadership to move forward with this. So all of our units um, have a bladder scan and bladder scanner. Um, I think at the time that we started this, we only had one mm -hmm. right in house, and so the one scanner was going all over the place and not consistently used. So now it's on every single unit. Um, that was a huge investment, but it was something that um, now is hardwired into our practice. Uh, we looked at <clears throat> external urinary devices with stabilization, um, and there's a picture of one that's there. Uh, these stabiliza stabilization devices now are in our indwelling uh, urinary kits, um, but we had to make sure that <clears throat> those were in place. The other piece of the external urinary devices, we we had um, looked at, um, mm -hmm. I draw a blank here, uh, Condom, condom yeah, catheters, yeah, right? External catheters. We had staff input on what these um, external catheters or external urinary devices because they weren't securing properly. So we had to take a look at those. We, uh, we the staff had a really great um, input into the indwelling urinary kits. Um, and as I had mentioned, um, these the kits that we have now are closed system. Um, there is, they all have hourly urimeters because we found that, again, when we started, there were some kits with bags and some with hourly urimeters. Now all of them have hourly urimeters and um, are really more conducive to hand hygiene and aseptic technique. Uh, as we were doing all of this work, uh, the folks that were working on their skip measures were asking us about our intermittent um, catheters. And so we had realized that although we had improved our indwelling urinary kits, our intermittent catheter kits, or straight cath kits, were not optimal. So we actually changed those as well. Um, we had to invest in mannequins <clears throat> because we were doing competency on all of our nurses. We did not have enough mannequins, so we invested in those. And as I had mentioned also, we are taking a look at our skincare products to really optimize um, peri care for our techs um, and general nursing population. We have an informatics specialist on our, our core team. Um, we now have a nurse-driven fully removal protocol. And this particular nurse-driven protocol took almost nine months, maybe almost a year, to get approved by our medical exec team. And what this protocol entails is that any patient with an indwelling urinary catheter, they all default to the protocol. The protocol is set so that um, each morning after following the order, the initial order of the Foley catheter, the nurse gets a pop-up um, on her computer asking if the patient meets the CDC criteria for an indwelling urinary catheter. If they do not meet the criteria, the Foley catheter is discontinued. So we have some growing pains related to that, um, you know, changing the culture of the nurse, um, proactively removing with the policy in place or protocol in place has been a struggle. Um, we find that our nurses are still calling the doctors to double check that the protocol was correct. So, you know, we're going through the growing pains of that and still, you know, reassuring our nurses that the protocol is the protocol. Um, and you are covered, and it has been approved by our medical executive team. Policies that we've put in place, number one, um, we our team developed a bladder scan um, algorithm, one for the inpatient setting and the other one for the emergency department. And these were created <coughs> by our staff nurses <coughs> excuse me, and approved by our medical executive team. Excuse me. Um, we have a policy for urine culture collection and practice, 
and as I had mentioned, our nurse driven protocol. Anything to add, Aaron, about that? Aaron has joined us, by the way. So monitoring, um, what you see here is an example of a tool that our managers use on a daily basis. Um, our utilization now is quite low, so every morning a report uh, based on a physician order or a provider order, um, uh, a report is sent to all of the managers and the quality team indicating which patients in the house have a Foley catheter. So the report comes out. The managers get this report, and on their um, daily rounds of all the patients, they use this tool to um, assess the maintenance of the Foley. <laughs> so they're checking to see, number one, um, is there an orange sticker in place? Is there a stabilization um, lock attached to the Foley? Is the red seal intact? And, and so forth. So they're going through and answering yes, no. And every single month, <laughs> every single month after one of our safety huddles, we come together, the managers and myself and um, the infection prevention team comes together and we take a look at this tool and this audit to see where are our opportunities for improvement. improvement. Where does it seem to be that we are not meeting our policy or complying with what we've identified as best practice? And at this point in time, what we're seeing is that the bags aren't being labeled. And I think that seems to be the greatest event. So we're going to take a look at this audit. Occasionally, the seal is broken as well. And, and the reason why the seal is, is um, broken is we're finding that some of our surgical um, teams are irrigating the Foley catheters. So my screen is frozen. I don't know if you guys see that. <coughs> Hey, this is Morgan. Um, I seem to be able to advance the slide, so if you would tell me when you want to go to the next slide, I will advance it for you. Okay. All right. So go ahead. Uh, the last one that I see is monitoring trends. You can go ahead, Morgan, and advance it. So as I had mentioned, um, this particular slide says sharing trends. <coughs> um, each month we do huddle with our physician leaders. Um, and our nurse leaders and our nursing shared governance, and we talk about compliance with the various um, components of potty prevention. Uh, our VP of what's Dr. Berman's title? Vice President of Medical Affairs. Medical Affairs. He wants a report um, of which physicians are complying with the protocol and not. So every month I give him a report based on the orders. Um, who is complying with the protocol or not. So at a very high level, um, we have support in our quality prevention efforts. If you can go to the next slide. So this slide is entitled Engaging um, Our Key Stakeholders. And you can see at the very front line is, you know, uh, all of the stakeholders are all of us. And WTF, that was our, that's what the staff had identified is why the Foley. They ask themselves that all the time. Why the Foley? Um, you know, our, our core team um, has developed algorithms, which I'm happy to share. I'll, I'll, I need to send these to Morgan to distribute if needed. Um, uh, the key stakeholders are our nurses who have served as champions. And again, these are our nurses at the front line and senior leadership. Um, senior leadership has been very supportive and very engaging in in our work in quality prevention. Next slide, please. So our outcomes. You can see by the star that that was 2013, the second quarter of that calendar year. And um, at the end of 2013, we had a spike of our quality rates. Our quality rates um, had gone up. Um, I, I will tell you that all of us were, you know, every time we get a cloudy, even now, we there's a sense of disappointment of what what did we do wrong, but yet we all think, what can we do to improve the work that we're doing? So um, we did have a spike, but since then, so looking into 2014 to present, 
we are now below the national benchmark as it relates to um, to CAUTI. So that's our, our CAUTI rate. If you go to the next slide, you can see our utilization rate with, again, the star being where we started. Um, we were above or at the national benchmark for utilization. And since our CAUTI initiative, we are now below the national benchmark, um, which is noted with the red horizontal line. So we're very proud of, of, um, of that. Next slide. I guess this is our final slide. Um, so what are our lessons learned? And again, um, if we can um, highlight anything, when you are building an interprofessional team, you have to engage the front line. Having a team that's predominantly uh, administrators or nurse leaders or physicians or infection control staff, it's going to be challenging. Um, you have to engage the front line because the compliance sustainability and sustainability is really is really coming from them. Your team has to be diverse and energetic. Um, I can honestly say our team that's been together since 2013, um, the core team is still there. We're still there. We've had actually new members join us. Um, and again, you need a Cotty Audi. Cotty member of Audra was our champion on the unit. She was our assistant patient care manager. She was really our primary driver of change. Um, and you have to know your stakeholders, you, um, our physicians, the nurses, our infection prevention team, um, our patients. Uh, it's, it's absolutely crucial to understand that, have your team understand that, and those that you're sharing the information with. And data, data, data. You need to be transparent. If you don't have dashboards up, um, get them up. We have, with our shared governance council, our quality council, every single month, uh, the information is shared um, with our staff nurses, and there was a lot of education that went um, on at the very beginning, but it was crucial for them to understand um, what it meant for a hospital-acquired infection. And again, share your story. This is why we are here working with Carol to get our, our story out, um, and we're happy to help. There's no point in reinventing the wheel. There's a lot of resources out there, and, and um, you know, folks are happy to share that information. So our last slide is a QA. and a um, We're happy to take questions, although our computer is frozen. I think we can still hear you on the polycom that we have in the office. Mm -hmm. So if um, I was actually reviewing the chat log, and a few questions did come in, um, mainly in regards to the presentation slide, which has been posted to the website. Um, I provided a link to that in the chat. Um, and then there was also um, some of the big comment they would love to have copies of the algorithms. So I posted in chat that we would be able to provide those in the follow-up email. Um, let's see. Are there any other questions I'm missing? Okay. So we did have um, a question come in. Did you have any pushback from providers regarding nurse-driven protocol when they Go ahead and use it. If so, how was this handled? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. <laughs> sure. This is Erin. Um, as we said, it took us uh, at least a year to get the nurse room protocol through medical exec, through all the physicians to approve it. Um, when we went to start using the nurse room protocol, the nurses were very apprehensive. Um, we had to make sure that the physicians were all educated in the fact that the, that the patient goes directly into the nurse-driven protocol, and that's the default. And we have had some uh, roadblocks, as Joe said, in the fact that some of the physicians either didn't get the education or didn't understand the education. Uh, so we haven't really had a lot of pushback in the fact of, fighting the nurse driven protocol because the ones that would like to fight it really didn't realize the patient was going directly in it. So um, primarily the pushback has been from the surgeons and um, we've been working with our chief of surgery to try and work individually with the physicians who um, are giving us the most issues and we're trying to, to listen to them and, and have taken, have undefaulted some of the patients say, the urology patients out of it. So we have had some pushback with that, but primarily we've dealt with it through our senior leadership who has been very supportive. 
All right, we've actually had a couple more questions come in. Um, if you had to choose, what one or two things drove your success? I, I will have to say, given our false starts initially, this is what Kia, uh, starting with a good, robust interdisciplinary team. Start there and identify those frontline staff and really support them. We supported Audra, and she really was the person who, whenever there was any issue, get that one person that you could have that dialogue with and just um, be sure that you could look it up. I think the other thing for us is really uh, going back and do, do assessing really what was in place, what did everyone know about Foley. I think that was important because when we found out that we needed to really train people to better understand uh, just what was going on with Foley's and having that discussion, people I don't think would have come forward and said that. It's when we started, we started to just take one thing that we could start to drive and get more people involved. We decided to look at all the nursing, the predominantly people who insert Foley's, and say, what can we do to make sure that they feel comfortable with this whole initiative? And we discovered that many of them were training, and they actually gave us very good feedback in terms of the equipment that was out there. I think that really started to galvanize us to say, okay, we're telling everyone to kind of do certain things, but we needed to know from them what were those impedances that we're keeping it from going forward. Yeah, so I just want to add to what Leslie had identified. You know, when we did our baseline assessment, we actually, um, the first thing that we had done is for every page, our baseline assessment, we identified, we did a prevalence study, number one. We looked at all the Foley's in-house, and we looked at the baseline to see which of those patients with the Foley met, um, you know, standards of care. Did, did they have the red seal? Was the bag below the bladder? Did they have a stabilization device? So we had some baseline information. We also um, assessed nursing knowledge of Foley catheter insertion. So we gave them a tray, had a mannequin, and then before we did any education, we assessed their ability to insert Foley catheters. And it was that having the baseline knowledge and baseline assessment that we said, you know what, we don't have a choice. We have to change because this is what our, our, our baseline information um, is telling us. And that's concrete information that you could help um, ha help your leadership understand better. When you have that concrete information and you're talking to them about, like <laughs> Joe put the dollar size next, next to equipment, some of it is at a cost, and you need to understand that you're not just asking for money. You're asking for a specific improvement to support the support of a specific improvement. And it is okay to go slow. Uh, leadership yes. does not fully embrace that. We went, we set our priorities. We had a huge laundry list, but we realized we had to be very methodical and, um, you know, do it step by step, not to rush because exactly. we weren't going to go anywhere very quickly. It took us, again, a year to get the nurse driven protocol approved. All right, so um, maybe I have a quick question for you. Can you guys stay on the line a little bit? We've had a couple more questions come in, but we're almost at the end of time. I was wondering if you could um, answer a few more. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to do some wrap-up things, and then we'll pull back to some more questions, just in case anybody has to get off the phone. Um, so as you guys know, um, actually, you don't know what I'm telling you. Huh. Um, as you close out of this webinar, you will be directed automatically to our evaluation. If you could please fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate it. If you don't have time to do it right now or you're sharing a computer with somebody else, you, re you will receive an email in the next few days with um, some follow-up information that um, I know the group wants to share with you guys, as well as a link to the evaluation. Um, in that email will also be a link to where you can find the recording of this presentation. Um, as I mentioned, the PowerPoint is already posted on the website, but the um, recording and transcript will be added in um, a few days. So going back to questions, um, we had one come in. Could you please tell us more about how you went about training all of the nurses on insertion? 
So um, we had a lot of help from our vendor. Yes. I'm not allowed to say. I don't know. I'm not allowed to say our vendor. So our vendor. <laughs> we um, so it was a collaborative approach with with the Department of Nursing Education and our vendor. Um, so from our end, we identified all the different units and then um, champions on the unit. So these were mainly nurses who wanted to kind of add this to their clinical ladder portfolio. Then we identified times that the vendor would help teach the class, and we used um, we took that opportunity to um, use them as subject matter experts, and we taught them. Then um, each of the unit-based champions, um, there's usually a, two or three from every unit. We took their unit census or staffing census, broke it up into three, and then those um, champions were given, you know, a team. So the expectation was in the next, I don't know, was it like two months or next? Two to three months. In the next two to three months, they had to sign off their peers on fully catheter insertion. If you need resources in terms of training, their vendors have resources. They have educators that work alongside them. So that's always helpful to bring them in and have them, you know, launch your training as well. We made sure we included the physician's assistants from the operating room because they were key in, in putting in the Foley's in the OR as well. All right, next question. Um, how did you educate the physicians on the nurse-driven protocol? That was a we, – we had a physician champion, uh, our infectious disease specialist, that Joe uh, talked about earlier, and she took on the education of the physicians. Joe and uh, Dr. Weather all went to MedExec to tell them about this whole Cali prevention program that we had, talk about the nurse driven protocol, the bladder scan. And after that, Dr. Witherall uh, attended their their annual meetings or their monthly meetings, sorry, and um, educated them that way. And then she's been very key in any of the uh, root cause analysis that we have. We, as we said, we've had a root cause analysis for every county that we have. She will call the physicians who worked with those particular patients individually and discuss the case with them. Excellent. Um, next question is, is there a plan to roll this out hospital-wide? Uh, yes. We started uh, rolling it out house-wide this year. And... Um, in my naivete, I thought ICU would be the most difficult area, so I was happy to have that done and figured we would just roll it out without an issue, any issues uh, housewide. But what we found is housewide has its own issues. Uh, much, much larger population, much more people to get to. Um, we are finding, you know, a different physician base, uh, much wider. Uh, we're dealing with different issues as far as surgical versus medical patients. So um, it, it, it's been moving along, and we did roll it out for this year, but we are meeting some different roadblocks along the way. All righty. And then one more question in chat. Do you have facility-wide perimeters. perimeters or just in the ICU? House-wide. That was one of the changes that we went to, so that they don't have to break the seal to put the urimeter on when they go to ICU. And even two days. The two days are also with urimeters. Excellent. Wow. Did not know that. All right. So if anyone on the line has an additional question, um, you can press pound six on your phone to unmute your line. Um, I know we're about five minutes over, but if there's any last questions out there, again, it's pound six to unmute your line. All righty. Well, it seems like we did get a lot of good questions in chat. Um, Carol, is there anything you want to finish up with? This was an outstanding presentation. Thank you, ladies, so much. And again, I know the, the participants will be looking forward to receiving the algorithms and maybe that um, audit tool that you used. 
um, that we can send along to them because, again, without baseline um, data, you don't know which direction to go. So thank you so much. And everyone have a great Thanksgiving. And hope okay. to see okay. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.